So in my last video, which was a life update video, I briefly mentioned how Cambridge made me dislike physics, and I guess I'll go into why into this video because a bunch of you were interested as to like what exactly happened or why. So for context, I matriculated in 2019, which is like when you start your degree, and I finished in 2022. In the UK, you can do a bachelor's in three years and a master's in one year, and I chose not to stay around for the master's because towards the end I just found myself like not liking physics anywhere near enough to like imagine myself doing it for another year. So as for some caveats before starting this video, uh, do you know about half my experience at Cambridge was sort of ruined by COVID um, because of online classes, online lectures, just like being at home for half of it. So I'll try to focus on the half that wasn't ruined by COVID. And I don't mean to come across as ungrateful in this video either, I still am very grateful for the opportunity that I had. I think it's just a case of like expectation versus reality. And given the chance, I'd probably do it all over again, but I would just be more mindful of like, hey, what I'm actually working towards and how I could make it work better for me. So I guess I'll start off by talking about why I applied to physics. And there are two reasons why. And um, the first reason, which I think was a more important reason, is because I wanted to maximize my chance of getting either into Cambridge or Oxford. And I knew that applying for physics was probably the best way of doing so because it makes sense to like apply for the subject you're the strongest at when applying for like a competitive university. And I just happened to be stronger at physics than I was at my other A levels like maths and chemistry. And I think that's because I generally had more of a feel or like an intuition for what was happening in the problem. I realized I was stronger at the subject because I did just did better in physics olympiads than like math olympiads or chemistry olympiads. And so applying for that subject made sense when you wanted to like go for Oxford or Cambridge. And the reason I wanted to apply for those universities was basically because it like carries a prestige or carries a weight and you can like start a YouTube channel about it and like people will follow or you can like put it on your CV and people will just assume you're competent for some reason. Um, I think it was good because it guaranteed some kind of like minimum standard or like minimum life quality in a way where you would like at least have guaranteed yourself a job in finance or consulting or something like that by going to such a university. And I think for me being from like an especially poor background, I sort of wanted that guarantee of like, hey, this is like the minimum job I'd be able to get from like graduating from this place. And also because the financial support system at Cambridge was really good compared to many other universities, where being from like a not so wealthy background, you have like more access to bursaries and just like general opportunities. And the second and lesser important reason why I chose physics is because it has this like glamour associated with it. Um, I guess like to describe it, it would be you have like famous scientists like Albert Einstein or Richard Feynman, like Paul Derek from the 20th century, who've made all these remarkable discoveries which have been like useful in our day to day lives now. And there's like this hard seeming thing like, oh, I want to understand relativity someday. I want to like understand quantum mechanics. Um, it's kind of popularized in like, I don't know, amongst like the public more so than like concepts from math are. And yeah, it just seems, it just seems to have this like interesting appeal for like popular media. Um, also, you had, I watched like a bunch of physics documentaries growing up, I watched like Veritasium, Physics Girl, and some other like YouTubers, and you kind of see these experiments or like observations and you're like, wow, I'd lo love to understand that someday. So yeah, those are pretty much the two reasons, like this like glamour associated with physics and also wanting to maximize my chance of getting into Cambridge. So as for what the course is like at Cambridge, um, you do physics via natural sciences. So Cambridge have a degree in natural sciences where you study a broad range of sciences in your first year. So I did maths, physics, material sciences, and chemistry. And then you choose what to specialize in in your following years. And I chose to specialize in physics in my second and third year. But I tell people that I did physics because most people don't know what natural sciences is. And the reason Cambridge do this is because they feel like for scientists, they have to have a broad understanding of the many different disciplines of science before they specialize. So they're like better at making discoveries because they think a lot of the like things or interesting problems in science are at the boundaries between like different disciplines. So like at the boundaries between like physics and biology. And if you did some biology in your first year, then that certainly helps. As for the course in second and third year when you're doing physics, you have a supervision every two weeks for each one of the, the like 
courses you're doing. So it could be like quantum mechanics, optics and electrodynamics. Like you'd have a supervision every two weeks for each of those courses. And you would have two to three lectures a week for each of the courses you're doing as well. So you basically go to lectures, you learn the material, and then you do the supervision like problems or like the problem sheet, hand it into your supervisor, they mark it, they go through it in the supervision, go through what you did wrong, help you understand the material better. And yeah, you would also go to labs as well. So in second year, you would have labs every two years, or oh, two weeks, sorry. And in third year, you can choose to opt out of labs entirely, or you can condense all your labs into like two weeks, depending on the modules you pick. So there's a like computing module where you have to like write some simulations in Python or C++. And then there's like a MATLAB like module, which you also have to do. And you can also choose to do um, one module, which is like research review, where you like review a bunch of papers and write like your own research review on the papers. Yeah, there are a bunch of things that you can pick. That's an overview of how the course works. And I guess I'll go through what I disliked about the course now. And the first thing is that the teaching isn't exactly, like, good. I think that comes surprising to many people who think of Cambridge because they're like, oh, like, elite university must have, like, some of the best teachers in the world. And it's, like, ranked highly on, like, the ranking tables, has just, like, been around for hundreds of years. And it just isn't really the case. And this is not myself thinking this. This is, like, hundreds of other people, like, in the year group and just like who did physics thinking of this where you would have some physics lectures or like the lecture would have 160 170 people in the lecture room at the beginning of like lecture one of that course and then like after lecture 20 or like 24 when you have the final few lectures only 20 or like 15 people would show up to that lecture just because people realized they weren't really learning from that lecture course and the lecturer was just kind of bad. And yeah, they basically just like stopped coming to a lecture and watched YouTube videos instead or just used a textbook. And I had a few other physics students come up with like theories as to why they think the lecture courses just aren't that good. And I think the thing that makes the most sense to me is that basically a lot of university ranking tables are decided based on like the research output or like of that university. And there seems to be like a negative correlation between how good someone is as a researcher and how good they are as a teacher. There's something called the curse of knowledge where um, it's easier to learn something from someone who is like two years ahead of you rather than like someone who's 40, 50 years ahead of you. Because a person who's like two years ahead of you knows and understands the struggles of learning this content and they can like explain the difficult parts better. Whereas for someone who's 50 years ahead of you, um, like they just forgot what it was like to learn this for the very first time and they're not able to like understand your struggles and explain the like challenging parts better because it's just like so second nature that to them so basically because of this negative correlation between like researchers and how like how good so someone is at research and how good they are at teaching cambridge incentivizes for like really good researchers to come to their university partly because they have really short term times so if you were to be a researcher there you would have teaching responsibilities as well as like an assistant professor or professor and they'd basically be like hey you only have to teach for like 20 weeks of the year because we have eight weeks eight week terms and the final term is like four weeks because the second half of the term is preparing for exams so it's like, hey, come and like do your research at our university because you only have to teach for 20 weeks of the year. So it incentivizes for really good researchers who just are also bad lecturers as well. And they also don't really enjoy teaching because the whole point in them wanting to do this was because they wanted to like minimize their teaching obligations as well. So yeah, because of this, me and like dozens of other people in the year group just relied on the textbook or like watched YouTube videos instead or just like tried to teach each other instead of actually going to some of these lectures. But do bear in mind some other lecture courses at Cambridge are really good. I've heard good things from some of my friends who studied maths about how good some of the like early lecture courses are. And now it comes to doing like the problem sheets which are based on the lecture material. You learn the lecture material in some way through like YouTube videos or the lecture if you can understand what the lecturer is going on about 
or the handouts which are given to you during the lecture, which are often like 10 years old and haven't really changed or been improved, or just like had very small modifications to. And you would basically learn the material in whatever way you can, and you would do the problem sheets. And you would do the problem sheet, which is due in for your supervision. And a supervision is basically where a PhD student or a postdoc, or basically someone from the department, goes through these questions, which are based on lecture material, and then like mocks your work to say how well you did, then basically goes through what you're struggling with. And the supervisions were really helpful, but it's more like the problems or the problem sheet questions were just kind of stupid. So you have some questions which just aren't really based on anything in the lecture material. And you have other questions which are just like so long-winded where it can take you like five to ten hours just to complete one question, only for it to like never come up in the exam. And even the supervisor kind of agreed, hey, this is kind of a stupid question. I don't know why this question is still on the problem sheet like after five years or so. And they'd usually explain like a trick or like a concept or something that the lecturer didn't cover on how to do the question because I don't think the lecturer actually even looked at some of the problem sheets. So yeah, it felt like you were learning much better in the supervision and the supervisor should have been the lecturer instead of the like actual lecturer. But because of how academia works and how you sort of have this like weird pyramid scheme like structure, usually the people who are in like positions of seniority are the ones who get to lecture. Whereas like the PhD student who's just able to explain something like 10 times better than the lecturer because they learned it like a couple of years ago and don't suffer from the curse of knowledge. Um, they're not able to teach a lecture because they don't have the seniority in like the academic like pyramid. And some of the supervisors were also nice enough to like write their own notes that explained concepts much better than the lecture notes. And it just kind of became a question of like, hey, this person should really be teaching this like lecture material. And the supervisor would usually say to not share their notes with like other students in the year. It would still happen ev eventually, but basically they wouldn't want their like solutions or problem sheets shared or like the notes shared throughout the year group. So it basically became like a lucky game of which supervisor you ended up having and how nice they were and how much preparation they did for your supervisions. But I generally think if all the students there were some supervisors who taught like half the year or one third of the year group. I think if some students were given like a vote to vote like whether to have the supervisor teaching the lecture course based on the ex like how good the explanations are or the lecturer, I think often it just makes sense for the supervisor to just be teaching the lecture course. And as for the lab reports, they were marked kind of randomly as well, where you'd have two people who have almost like identical lab reports in the way they're structured, the like ways that, ways they explain things and such and such. And then they would just get randomly or like vastly different marks where someone would end up getting like, I don't know, 60% for their lab report and someone else would get 80, 85%, even though they're just very similar. And the lab reports basically taught me that, hey, like the department doesn't really care about like accurate or consistent marking. And many of the people who did physics in my college also agreed to that, hey, the lab reports are just kind of marked randomly. And I think when it came to exams, the exams were probably the most surprising thing to me and many other students, where there would be like mistakes in the actual exam itself. And you'd be sitting in the middle of the exam, it's like a two, two, two and a half hour exam, and basically one hour and 30 minutes in, someone would find a mistake, report it, they would ring up the like person who wrote the exam, the examiner would confirm its mistake, and then they would announce it to everyone in the exam hall being like, hey, there's a mistake on like this page, like correct it. And the amount of mistakes in the exams just became like kind of questioning like, hey, what ex exactly am I like paying for here when they're not able to like write an exam properly? Even like my GCSE or like A-level exams, they just didn't really have any mistakes. Also, many exam questions were just repetitions of like previous year exam questions. So it didn't become a question of like, how well you understood the lecture course and became a question of like how many of the previous year exam questions have you done where you'd see some questions that are basically repeated like four or five times over the course of 10-15 years and other exam questions were basically a case of like a recall um one difficult thing that i found was you can't really like 80 20 the course because there would be like a 200 page handout for like 
course. And it would have some like weird obscure proof on like page 172. And then an exam question can basically ask for you to repeat that. And it became a case of like having to know almost every single page of the handout, which just became like very annoying because for me, I thought learning physics was about learning like a few fundamental ideas and then being taught how to answer basically any exam questions based on these ideas. Whereas here it became more of a case of how well have you like learned every single page of the handout and can you repeat these like obscure and random proofs um, just for the sake of like the exam. I think that basically subtracted a lot of the fun away from physics where it wasn't about like conceptually trying to understand this course content deeper and deeper. It was more about like doing as many exam questions from previous years as possible in the hopes one of the ones you did before comes up. And secondly, just learning as many of the pages in the handouts as possible as well. And there are a bunch of other small details which just kind of like showed, hey, the department doesn't really care about us because I think the department just didn't really care about the undergrads as much as the like PhD students. And many supervisors I spoke to kind of agreed like, hey, this the department doesn't really care about you guys, like wait until you're like grad students and then you'll like get treated more favorably. And I think that's really sad to see because there'd be many people who are like really great at physics, many who are like significantly better than me at Cambridge. And they just agreed that after university, they just wouldn't do physics again because of the experience that they had. And I think it's kind of sad because you basically have like a whole generation of like scientists or like physicists who are being put off when studying here, but they only want to continue studying here because of like the clouds is more valuable than like the pain that they would go through through studying physics. Oh, and also you would watch lecture courses online by other universities or see handouts online by other universities. And you just kind of think like, wow, like this is significantly better than, hey, like our lecture courses. I think MIT puts a lot of their lecture courses online for others to watch because they're just really great courses. Whereas I don't think Cambridge would ever put any of their physics courses online because it'd be more of an embarrassment rather than like, wow, this is a really great course. But yeah, um, I think another significant reason why I just didn't like physics, not so much related to Cambridge, is because the, phys the future of physics kind of seems bleak in general. Um, I've met many PhD students who just said that they were doing the PhD. So the PhD students are helping out in the labs and they just said they were doing the PhD because they didn't really know what else to do. Um, and they just didn't want to get a job. So they just like chose to do a PhD in physics because that was their undergrad. And it also feels like not a lot of development is happening in physics compared to like the early 20th century. I think the early 20th century was the golden age of physics where you'd have so many like research and discoveries being done. And Sabine Hostenfielder has kind of made a few videos about physics, has talked about how physics has been led astray. And yeah, there just hasn't really been any significant progress for the last 50 years. And I think when you look at the world now and you consider what the golden age is now, it's definitely not physics. It has to be like artificial intelligence and just computer science in general. It's amazing because like 10 years ago, you could barely distinguish between like cats and dogs with a computer. And now computers are basically able to generate these very lifelike images, videos, like text that you can't even know if, whether a computer wrote or a human wrote. And it just is gonna continue to grow and get better and like make profound changes in our day-to-day -day lives significantly faster than like, say, random research in physics about, hey, like, does this particle exist? Does this other particle exist? I just think it's more valuable for a lot more resources or like talents where people are just doing physics PhDs because they don't know what, what else to do for them to be working on like artificial intelligence instead. But I think I also have a personal preference as well because one thing I realized during university is that I really like short feedback loops. So in a lab, you could like run an experiment for a whole day and then get your results at the end of the day. And then you probably wouldn't know whether you're right or wrong until like a couple of days later, depending on the experiment you're doing. Whereas at least when you're coding, you can know whether you're right or wrong almost immediately because you add a few lines of code, you run it, you might get an error, you might not. And then you write more lines of code, you run it again. And the feedback loop is just much faster and it helps you iterate more quickly too. But yeah, I think I might flesh out my thoughts here and make a future video 
about how I feel like physics is kind of lost as a whole, and that I probably would have preferred to do computer science instead at university. But the difficult thing about doing computer science, at least applying to Cambridge, is because the demand has, for computer science has grown massively of the number of students applying for it, but the department for computer science is far too small to like house all the number of students. So applying to computer science at Cambridge is like much more competitive than physics. And given that I cared more about the like name of Cambridge instead of like the degree I was doing itself, I just, I think I would still apply for physics given the same opportunity again. Just because the computer science department is like not big enough to have all the students who are applying. Um, I heard they are constructing a new department, but of course that will take some time and it will just continue to get more competitive until then. So yeah, I guess if I watch this video before applying, then I would still apply for physics if it was the subject I was the strongest at, because I think more of the value from university comes from the signaling like that it carries, whether that's to future employers or friends or family. I think you can. it's kind of clear that university carries signaling value, because if you have like eight semesters across your entire degree, and you complete like seven of the eight semesters and then you drop out, you won't make seven eighths of the like money that someone who completed the entire degree would. You'd probably get like a, qu a half the salary or something because you didn't actually complete the, the degree. So I think it just signals to future employers like, hey, this person is capable of like completing this challenging thing more so than oh, the thing that they actually studies, studied is going to be useful in our, like, employment. But yeah, I think I have a couple of thoughts on what the value of university is anyways, and I think I'll make a future video about it, and then basically make a few more videos about, like, post-university reflection, whether that be, like, physics as a whole, what's the value of university, things I would do differently, and so on. But yeah, if you made it this far, hopefully some of that rambling was kind of interesting to you, and maybe helped you make some decision for the future. And do send me a message if you're curious or like want to hear any more specifics. That can be on my Instagram, which I check the most frequently, linked in the description.